everyone. Welcome to Commercial Music and Intergenerational Community in the Toyama City Center. I'm Annie Boldman here live from New York City with the, uh, the Japan Foundation New York's Japanese Studies team. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Tonight's lecture is part of Illuminating Japanese Studies lecture series with former Japan Foundation fellows. Since the fellowship program began in 1972, there have been more than 1,000 American fellowship recipients. From pre-modern history to pop culture and everything in between, this lecture series will illuminate what exactly Japanese studies can teach us, not only about Japan, but about the world. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Donnie Scali. Um, he is a lecturer of music at Goucher College, and he received his PhD in ethnomusicology from the University of Maryland College Park in 2021, and he was also a Japan Foundation Doctoral Fellow in 2019. Our moderator for the following question and answer session is Dr. Jennifer Matsue. Um, she is an ethnomusicologist and professor of music at Union College. She has conducted research on the Tokyo hardcore rock scene, Nagauta, Taiko, Japanese religion and popular music, and Vocaloid Hatsune Miku. Dr. Matsue was also a Japan Foundation Doctoral Fellow in 1997. For more information about our speakers, please check out the description box down below. The lecture will be followed by a live Q&A session, so please drop your questions in the YouTube chat box at any time during the lecture. We ask that you keep the chat clean, friendly, and respectful. Now let's go ahead and begin the lecture. Toyama City is a small city on the west coast of Honshu, the largest Japanese island. Like many other small cities in Japan and elsewhere, its population is shrinking while the average age increases. Unlike many of its peers, Toyama City has rejected the ultimately apocalyptic capitalistic logic that demands growth or collapse. The city is seeking ways to provide for residents more efficiently as the population shrinks. Over the past several years, the city has engaged in a suite of projects collectively termed the Compact City Plan. These projects include updates to the city's transportation and healthcare infrastructure to make sure all residents, including the elderly and disabled, have access to vital services and opportunities for socialization and recreation. Because Toyama City is an administrative unit that resulted from multiple waves of consolidation, it covers a very large geographic region that includes both densely populated urban areas and sparsely populated rural ones. The Compact City Plan includes financial incentives for residents to move closer to the city center to make infrastructure updates more efficient. But many residents in outlying areas feel a deep attachment to their homes and are unwilling to move. In order to allow these residents to age in place, the municipal government has adopted a spokes on a wheel design for the city's major transportation lines, with trains and bus routes connecting all of the population centers through the largest population hub in the city center, where the population is already most concentrated. The Compact City Plan also includes economic incentives for companies to hire older residents who may have already retired from a first job, keeping these residents active, engaged, and contributing to local production and economic activity. Toyama City has attracted national attention for its novel approach to the challenges associated with a shrinking and aging population. One major obstacle remains, however, on the city's path to resilience. Toyama City cannot shrink indefinitely. Eventually, there will simply be too few people and too few resources to provide for those who remain. The population must stabilize, even if the overall size is significantly less than what it is today. The programs of the Compact City Plan go a long way toward making it possible for residents to remain in place, but local people, particularly young people, must also want to stay, rather than leaving for larger cities to pursue more lucrative or exciting opportunities. To this end, Cultivating a deeply felt connection to Toyama City, the place and its people across generations is important to the city's future. In her studies of the Owara Kazenobon, a festival featuring a distinct dance performance, and Shishimai, lion dances of Yatsuo Machi, one of the larger peripheral population centers of Toyama City, Magao Yoko has demonstrated how traditional performing arts through their learning and communal co-performance can create strong ties between generations in place. In her study of Shishimai, she proposes the idea of tsunagari as central to this type of deeply felt connection. According to Ngao, tsunagari derives from the verbs tsunagu and tsunagaru, meaning to connect or link so that objects are supported by a base or connected objects. They project an image of a chain in terms of how objects are connected. 
Tsunagaru connotes the willingness of each part to connect to each other part. Applied to the social realm, it signifies relationships with a willing mutual involvement. It generally implies affectionate relationships between people, but it can include neutral, competing, or tense relations. When mentioned within the context of kinship or a highly conservative community, the term tends to have an obligatory tone. Toyama City's success in its search for resilience with a smaller but stable, well-supported, and well-connected population hinges on local people's ability to connect with one another across generations, keeping a tightly knit and thriving population rooted in place. The Compact City Plan has made great progress toward making sure all residents have access to the infrastructure they need to live and socialize. It has also introduced incentive programs to keep older residents working or engaged with the city and its younger residents in other ways, such as through volunteering. Ultimately, however, making sure people can connect does not guarantee they will. In some of the outlying areas of Toyama City, traditional performing arts associated with festivals, such as Yatsuo's Owarakaze no Bon, are major drivers of intergenerational connections. But the city center, where the population is most concentrated, does not have any single emblematic creative or social activity that represents the place and its people. Here such socialization happens, if at all, through a more haphazard collection of formal and informal means. Music performances with both younger and older people in both the audience and the performing ensemble are common, indicating that local people are indeed making the kinds of connections across generations needed to establish and maintain Tsunagari, the crucial social element that might sustain a relatively small interconnected population into the future. A major goal of my research in Toyama is to understand the role that music plays in creating and maintaining community in the city. What I have found is that social practices, like musical performances, provide the bottom-up, grassroots counterpart to the top-down municipal programs and policies of the Compact City Plan. Understanding, in detail, how music creates and maintains communities tied to place in Toyama City is thus one vital piece to assessing whether and how Toyama's Compact City Plan might work in other places and communities. Ethnomusicologist Thomas Torino proposes the ideas of cultural cohorts to describe affinity groups organized around music or another social activity, and cultural formations to describe the interconnected groups united by shared conventions of behavior and symbolic meaning. Because these concepts describe social configurations that are not necessarily anchored to place, they're inadequate in themselves to describe the networks of people, places, ideas, symbols, technologies, and practices that I will discuss today. Torino's focus on semiotics, the study of the signs, indexes, and symbols that convey meaning, is an important starting point, but must be expanded to include those social actors like places, instruments, or even concepts, like musical genres, that do not have intentionality, as well as the affective element of social interaction, that part of experience that defies semiotic capture. The physical structures, the beings that inhabit them, the technologies used in these spaces, and the discursive concepts generated all materially affect one another, creating complex and vital social assemblages. A key point to this is that agency, the ability to act in a social situation, does not require intent or even the ability to intend. To understand the details of communities organized around music in the Toyama City Center, I draw concepts from Bruno Latour's work on actor network theory, Karen Barad's agential realism, and Donna Haraway's call to adjust our perspective to one of becoming with a host of human and non-human companions. According to Latour, agency, the ability to act or have an effect, is not inherent to any entity, but arises through assemblages of potential co-actors in specific contexts. Barad extends this work observing that agents created situationally through assemblages and contexts simultaneously give rise to one another. These, in turn, may be separated and understood in different ways, interpretations which themselves have material effects, becoming part of the observed context. Haraway adds a call to action to this understanding, noting that the relationships Barad describes as entanglements that connect humans to each other, non-human entities and objects, and our environment, demand an ethical consideration of these various partners, as well as being necessary to our survival. She proposes a constructive way forward through salvaging, or composting, what is salvageable from the landscape of late capitalism. A landscape characterized by increasing inequity and precarity, and reorienting ourselves toward a collaborative relationship defined by mutual responsibility and care with our many organic and inorganic companions, in order to achieve a sustainable and more equitable future. These ideas can certainly upset our conventional understanding of the self and individual boundaries. 
Am I, as I am used to experiencing and thinking about myself, a separate individual or a mega organism comprised of multiple semi-independent but symbiotic and in some instances parasitic micro and macro organisms? There are foods I regularly consume that I would be unable to fully digest without the aid of the microorganisms inhabiting my body. Others regularly help protect me from potential microscopic invaders that might cause disease. As long as all of us are contributing adequately, the symbiotes that help make me and I operate pretty seamlessly. At the same time, all of these organisms operate autonomously, without my conscious effort or intention, as do many of my own organs. Even within a single human body, intention is not necessary for agency, the ability to act socially, collaborate, and have a material impact. Applying the same principle to larger scale social configurations or networks of actors, we can understand social groups of all sizes from a family unit to a neighborhood organization, to a city, to a nation state, to an international cooperative alliance as similar to either mega organisms or ecosystems. In the case of communities anchored to place, like the ones I describe in this talk, the most fitting metaphor I can come up with is a lichen, where in a stationary fungus incapable of individually providing enough fuel for its own maintenance and survival provides structure and shelter for a symbiotic photosynthesizing but otherwise vulnerable bacterium. As club owners, musicians, and audiences interact within particular physical spaces, they generate the energy in the form of both monetary exchange and emotional investment necessary to the maintenance of these spaces and the individuals who occupy them. Memories of these experiences accumulate, adhering to the spaces themselves and inspiring new social interaction until the place itself acquires a particular character that may be legible even to newcomers, a character that is difficult to explain through any immediately observable specific features. This individual character informs interactions that occur in the space and helps structure communities. Because, unlike the spaces themselves, the people in them may move through other spaces, these communities fixed in place may inspire the generation of others, some of which may even result in the creation of new physical locations that act as centers for their own musical lichens. These new social spaces, anchored in place, are distinct from their parents, but carry something of the character of their predecessors through the experiences and attachments of the people who create them. In this talk, I discuss three longtime fixtures of the commercial music scene in Toyama City. The Cotton Club was founded by multi-genre guitarist Tami Matsuda. He engages selectively in mentorship and collaborations with younger musicians. His approach, which is not unique to him, but practiced by other older musicians in Toyama City's commercial music scene, is exemplary of the kind of professional intergenerational relationships necessary to Toyama City's future. Alibaba, a blues club founded by guitarist and singer Osamu, a longtime friend and mentor of Tommy's, though its activities are winding down, has filled a similar role for decades, even serving as an influential model for the operations of the Cotton Club. Finally, Five Spot, the oldest of the three clubs, operates using a different model, acting as a jazz cafe during the week and hosting a handful of both established and promising local musicians on Friday and Saturday evenings, all under the expert curation of the owner. The discussion of these three clubs that follows will demonstrate some of the existing models for creating intergenerational community in place through commercial music in the Toyama City Center, as well as variations between them. The Toyama City Cotton Club lies at the end of a narrow, partially covered walkway on the outskirts of Sakuragi-cho, a tangle of narrow alleys and neon that sits across the street from Toyama Castle Park. The neighborhood broods quietly, nearly abandoned until the sun sets, when it springs to a noisy and exuberant life as the artificial daylight of signs announcing a range of nightlife venues flickers on, and the sounds of music and conversation leak from within the bars, restaurants, and clubs that populate the area. The Cotton Club is currently Toyama City's longest operating full-time commercial live music venue and hosts performances featuring the owner and his daughter six nights a week. As one of Toyama City's oldest active professional commercial musicians, the owner, guitarist Tami Matsura, plays an important role in the continuity of the small but active commercial music scene. I first came to the Cotton Club in fall 2011. I was working as an assistant English language instructor for two local high schools through the Japan Exchange teaching program. My supervisor at Yatsuo High School knew that I was a jazz musician and left a magazine advertisement for the Cotton Club on my desk one day. The sticky note attached explained that while my supervisor was not familiar with the place or with jazz in general, she knew I was interested and thought I might want to check it out. 
The next Thursday, when I was teaching at a different school closer to the club, I stopped by after work. As I entered, a husky voice called out, Ira Shai, welcome, from the far end of the room. A gray-haired man sat on a stool in the center of a stage at the end of the room, a guitar in his hands and a cigarette dangling from the corner of his mouth. He stood and wiped his guitar down with a cloth before placing it on a stand and casually walking over to me. We introduced ourselves. He told me his name was Tommy Matsura and that he was the owner and main performer at the Cotton Club. Upon hearing that I had experience as a jazz bassist, he told me he had just fired the bassist for his Saturday night band and invited me to audition for the spot. We walked over to the stage. He handed me a Fender jazz bass that was hanging from a hook on the wall and showed me the bass amp. We played a blues and a bossa nova together. He said he liked my sense of time, but my tone needed work, and he told me to come back to play on Saturday night. I would play with him at the club on alternate Saturday nights and occasional additional dates until I returned to the U.S. in summer 2012. He had also recently recruited a drummer in his early 20s, Tango Ryo, with a similar arrangement to mine. When Tommy's daughter Yuri, a pianist, was back in Japan during breaks in her graduate studies at Berklee College of Music in Boston, she also joined us. In September 2019, I returned to Toyama for a year of dissertation fieldwork with the support of a Japan Foundation Fellowship. I had visited Tommy and Yuri at the Cotton Club briefly three times in the intervening years. This time, as always, Tommy looked up from his guitar as I entered, told me, with no sign of surprise whatsoever, that I had walked in after a long absence. Donnie, good, you're here. Go get tuned up, and wave me toward the stage. Older performers teaching younger ones is nothing new in Japanese performing arts. Traditional Japanese performing arts pedagogy, enshrined in the Iemoto, or guild system, typically includes strict hierarchical relationships organized primarily by seniority in the art. In her study of traditional Japanese dance, Tomie Han discussed the system of transmission that eventually brought students to embody the art and their own lineage in performance, even as the art itself was constantly transformed through the individual performances and performing bodies that continue to give rise to it. Other music researchers, including Waseda Minako and Christine Yano, have demonstrated how this system has come to define, with some adaptations, Japanese performing arts pedagogy in foreign contexts as well as in popular music styles. Tommy's activity as a mentor, though similar in many aspects, is fundamentally different from the Iemoto system. The Iemoto system acts primarily as a means of providing for the continuity of an art. Tommy's approach is more suited to training collaborators understood as individual creative performers, free to draw on multiple traditions and lineages and encouraged to cultivate their own distinct styles. These performers are not vehicles or embodiments of a single core art form. This allows for difference and disagreement among performers without necessarily resulting in a major rift in style or community. While I have more experience at the Cotton Club than any other Toyama clubs, it is my impression from spending time with other older musicians at Toyama that this is a common outlook. Before his death in 2018, the owner and maiden performer at Blues Club Alibaba expressed excitement about the possibility of collaborating with younger musicians from outside of Toyama following the 2015 opening of a new high-speed rail line connecting the small city to Tokyo, the owner of Five Spot, a long-operating jazz club, once told me, after hearing me play with a few other younger musicians, that he wished he could join us, if only he still had enough fingers to play the saxophone. In the following section, I discuss working with Tommy over time and the song Sketch of Summer, a song Tommy wrote and revised with Yuri and me. As a specific example of this type of intergenerational relationship among Toyama's professional commercial musicians. Tommy first recorded the song Morning Shower on his 2008 album Roots with Yuri, synthesizer player Ota Yoko, bassist Takeda Satoru, and drummer Ikehata Soto. This song is a slow to medium speed instrumental bossa nova. The relaxed tempo, Ikehata's light touch on the cymbals, and sustained airy reverberating timbres of the synthesizer and guitar lend a spacey atmospheric feel to the piece. When I first started playing with Tommy at the Cotton Club in 2011, he gave Tango Ryo and me copies of his album so that we could listen to and study his original songs in what, at the time, he felt was their ideal version, helping us get a sense of his style and how we would fit in as supporting band members. We played Morning Shower and a few of Tommy's other original compositions at the club. Mixed in among an eclectic repertoire of jazz standards, songs from old Japanese television and radio commercials, classic rock songs, Brazilian popular music, tango, and occasionally an original arrangement of a folk song, Coquitico. 
Yudi also sometimes contributed her arrangements of pieces by Ravel and Debussy, though these were typically solo piano performances used as an introduction to a set or a musical interlude. As we got to know one another better, and as Tommy became more comfortable with Ryo and my abilities as band members, he began to ask us to help him come up with set lists. He explained that his technique for choosing appropriate and entertaining repertoire was to estimate audience members' ages, then choose songs that were popular around the time they would have been teenagers. Tommy believed that most people's musical tastes were heavily impacted by the songs, artists, and genres with which they engaged the most during puberty. When younger patrons entered the club, Tommy seemed to think Rio and I might be better judges of what they would recognize. In these instances, we tended to play a lot of songs from classic films and tunes by the Beatles, songs that the three of us knew or Tommy had charts for and would likely at least be familiar to both older and younger audience members. In 2012, toward the end of my first stay in Toyama, Tommy began showing Rio and me some of the charts he was writing or revising. He would sometimes ask us to come in on Sundays, the only day of the week that the club was typically closed, to workshop and rehearse some of his songs. He gradually began asking more and more what we thought might work well in specific instances, asking Ryo how to transition between different feels on the drum set or what the best term for a particular rhythmic figure was. Tommy is a completely self-taught musician and I had a bachelor's degree in jazz performance, so he would most often ask for my input on questions involving music theory or so-called functional harmony although once his daughter Yuri returned, this role usually fell to her. While there was a great deal of variety in the music we performed, it was rare that Tommy brought in a totally new arrangement or song for us to work on. He had four binders full of one to two page charts of songs that he had written, arranged, or transcribed from recordings already, which he would often revisit and revise. Shortly after my return to Toyama in 2019, Tommy asked me to work on one of his songs with him. He wanted to revise the song Morning Shower from his first album. He had already changed the name to Sketch of Summer. He told me that, in addition to some changes to the feel, structure, and harmonies, he wanted the song to have English language lyrics. He told me that the inspiration for the song was the feeling of both physical and emotional warmth he remembered from when he was in middle school, around 14 or 15 years old, waking up in the summer and walking to school, looking up at the sky while the sun still sat low near the horizon. He wanted lyrics in English that captured that feeling, and he wanted me to write them. I got to work right away, and I returned the following week. I had a draft of lyrics ready. He read through them and nodded his approval, then laughed a little and said, but I'm always changing it. He had reworked some sections, and the lyrics no longer fit the structure. He showed me the sections he wanted to change, then we talked through what he wanted to include and the feeling he wanted to convey, before agreeing on a new structure to the song. This basic process happened two more times before he was happy. At this point, we started trying to play the song with Yuri. After reading through the song, Tommy said there were a few spots that didn't sound right to him. We went back to those spots and played them again. Tommy then asked Yuri what she thought was going awry and what the chords should be in those spots. She provided some suggestions, which he penciled into the chart. We played through the song again, and after repeating this process a few times, arrived at a final version of the song. After writing the revisions into the bass chart, he gave me a copy and told me that I should perform it with my own group when I got back to the US. The end result, in addition to the added lyrics and changes to the structure, melody, and harmony, is faster than the original form of Morning Shower and includes more dramatic shifts between bossa, samba, and hard driving rock feels. In the time I have known Tommy, he's gradually brought me further into his creative process as a collaborator and contributor. Initially, as a much older man and a more experienced musician, not to mention the band leader and owner of the venue where we most frequently performed together, he gave a lot of advice and expected me to listen. As we played together longer, he trusted me with more decisions about repertoire and composition. On my last visit in 2019 to 20, he asked me to write a song with him. This type of relationship makes sense. Seasoned professionals and skilled trades often have an active role in training subsequent generations. What is significant about Tommy's approach to younger musicians is that this is not a passing of the torch. At no point has Tommy acted as though he were planning for his own obsolescence. Rather, he has invested in the training of promising younger musicians, cultivating colleagues so that he can eventually perform and collaborate with them in an increasingly balanced relationship. This type of intergenerational relationship, in which older professionals establish connections with younger people, 
play an important role in their training and ultimately gain new collaborators while remaining active themselves is a key element in Toyama City's prospects for resilience. This type of relationship is also not a new phenomenon in Toyama City's commercial music scene. While I don't know the details, Tommy once hinted that Osamu, the late owner of blues club Alibaba and Tommy's longtime friend, played some role in his early career in Toyama's commercial music scene. During a visit to Toyama City in the summer of 2015, after playing two sets with Tommy at the Cotton Club, he asked me to come with him to another club. He wanted to introduce me to Osamu, the owner and main performer at Alibaba, a blues club on the second story of a row of tightly packed storefronts in the narrow alleys that surround Sogawa Dori, the covered shopping street in the Toyama city center. We entered to find the small smoky club packed with every seat taken and customers crowding around the bar and leaning against the walls while drinking, talking, eating, and listening to a duo of gray haired men playing acoustic guitars and singing in harmony. Tommy and I stood near the door, seemingly the only empty spot left in the room full of people until the end of the song. When one of the guitarists announced they would take a set break, then waved Tommy and me over. Tommy introduced me to the man who had waved us over, whose name I learned was Osamu. The two men sat and talked through the set break. By the ease and informality of their conversation, they were clearly longtime friends. Their conversation focused mostly on their respective clubs and the changes they had seen with the recent opening of a new high-speed train line connecting Toyama directly to Tokyo. Tommy was concerned that he had lost some customers because people on business trips between Tokyo and Kanazawa no longer had to spend the night somewhere in between the two, so these professionals no longer came to the Cotton Club seeking food, drinks, and entertainment. Osamu indicated that he might have lost a few drop-in customers, but Toyama's increased accessibility had already brought new musicians to the city, and he was excited about the possibilities for collaborations, particularly with younger touring musicians. Tommy remained skeptical, telling Osamu that not all of the younger musicians understood the way he and Osamu ran their clubs. In Japan, there are many live music venues known as live houses, which provide space and varying degrees of support, sometimes including equipment rentals and bartending or other logistical services for a rental fee. Musicians rent the space, then sell tickets and collect entry fees themselves. Apparently, as Toyama City became a viable stop for musicians on national or regional tours of Japan, Tommy had begun receiving requests from younger musicians, unfamiliar with the Cotton Club, to rent the space for performances. He had responded that he was open to collaborations, but wanted to hear them perform and would consider playing with them. Some, unfamiliar with the idea of a club in which the owner was also the main performer, had responded with anger at the proposition. During this exchange, Tommy referred to the model Osamu had set referring to the other guitarist as senpai, a respectful term for an elder or more experienced person, making it clear that Tommy had learned something of this way of running a club and making a stable living as a musician from Osamu. Alibaba did not have any online presence aside from a searchable mark on Google Maps, so any performers who managed to contact Osamu about potential collaborations or playing at his club likely either had already met him in person or knew someone who had. The conversation moved on and eventually Osamu took the stage again, performing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, along with a mixture of blues and classic pop songs, including early 20th century Tin Pan Alley songs and 1950s to 70s R&B rock and folk songs. Tommy and I left the still packed club at around 2 a.m. When I returned to Toyama City in 2019, I stopped by Alibaba a few times, finding it closed, a sign still advertised regular musical performances and listed regular evening opening hours, so I made a note to try again if I was in the area at the right time without any other scheduled engagements. One night at the Cotton Club, I overheard some patrons talking about a recent visit to Alibaba, so the next Friday night I returned. When I arrived, I found the metal gate that had covered the entrance on my previous trips pulled up. I pushed open the heavy door and entered the club to find it deserted. The walls were lined with guitars and posters of famous blues and rock musicians, some of them signed. Between these were photographs of Osamu. Some depicted him playing, but others showed him after running the Toyama Marathon or lined up with a local recreational rugby team. A television mounted near the ceiling in one corner played video of live blues and classic rock performances. When I walked in, a video of B.B. King performing with Eric Clapton was playing. A woman emerged from behind the bar after hearing the door open and took me to a table. 
She handed me a drink menu and asked if I could read Japanese. I told her I could, to which she responded, good, that's all we have. She disappeared behind the bar again for a few minutes, then came back and asked to take my owner. She returned soon, carrying a whiskey on the rocks, and sat at the table with me. We spoke for a while. I learned her name was Masayo, and Osamu was her husband. When I told her I was studying music in Toyama City, she told me that I should come back on a Saturday night when they might have live music. It was then that she told me Osamu had died about a year earlier, but that she would be happy to talk to me any time I wanted to come back. She had opened Alibaba with Osamu in 1985 and had been there almost every night since. On subsequent visits, I learned that Masayo spoke fluent English, although she had never traveled abroad and had never even left the Toyama City Center for more than a day or two. She said foreigners, particularly students, sometimes came to the bar and most of them knew English better than Japanese. She explained that she felt part of her duty as a bartender was to act as an informal ambassador to Toyama, but that unlike other such representatives, she would only introduce those places she knew personally. These included some of the lesser known or advertised, but still worthwhile places in Toyama. I returned a few times and spoke with Masayo each time. My last visit was in March, 2020, shortly before I had to abruptly leave Toyama City due to the spreading pandemic. This time, a middle-aged man in a dark suit and white shirt entered shortly after I had arrived. He greeted Masayo loudly with a slight slur in his voice that indicated he had already been drinking that night. She smiled and took him to the table next to mine, returning from the bar with a bottle of red wine and two glasses, one for each of them. She introduced the two of us, and the man, whose name was Sato, tried a few English phrases with me. My name is Sato. Nice to meet you. Where are you from? And why did you come to Toyama? Masayo told him I spoke Japanese, and after some short small talk, he seemed to lose interest in me, conversing with Masayo, but occasionally turning back to me and loudly introducing himself or asking where I was from again in English. During a pause in their conversation, Sato looked at the small stage area, where a microphone, a stool, an amplifier, and Osamu's acoustic guitar sat quiet but ready as though at any moment their owner would return to once again bring the bar to an excited life with his music, playing through the night and into the early morning as he had for the last nearly 35 years. Sato began to repeat the word dame, no good, first as a whisper, but growing louder into a shout. He continued shouting toward the stage, how old were you? And you are working so hard every day. Will I die too? I just wanna hear you play one more time. Masayo poured herself another glass of wine as Sato grew quiet. He said he wanted to sing something and asked if he could do karaoke using the club sound system. Masayo shook her head and told him Osamu would never allow it. Sato gradually calmed and called for a taxi. After seeing Sato out, Masayo disappeared to the bar and returned with a glass of whiskey. She sat it down in front of me, took the seat across from me at the table and asked if I had ever heard her husband play. I told her I had once when Tommy had brought me to the club. She said that was good and paused. For a moment, her habitual smile faded and she nodded her head, sitting uncharacteristically silent. Her husband had been performing nearly every night up until the day he died of a sudden and unexpected heart attack. He was older than Masayo, who was in her 60s. Both of them were active and healthy, going to the gym most days, running the Toyama Marathon every year, except for the last two in which they had only run the half marathon and performing and tending bar, respectively, nearly every night. Their musician friends still came to perform sometimes to help keep the club going, but Masayo told me that she was probably getting ready to retire and that she was really just keeping Alibaba open until she figured out what to do next with her life. Maybe she would travel, something that had always interested her, but that she had never found the time to do. We sat together for a while, the conversation gradually moving on to other things. When I got up to leave, I tried to pay, but she dismissively waved away my offer, saying not to worry about it. She saw me to the door, smiling faintly. Although its time as a fixture of Toyama City's commercial music scene may be nearing an end, Alibaba has served as the physical focal point for a musical community for decades. The club and its owners established a model that has been imitated by other now longtime fixtures of Toyama City's commercial music. Until his final days, Osamu performed and, by all accounts, was genuinely excited by opportunities to collaborate with others, including younger or less experienced musicians. Even if Alibaba ceases operations and no longer hosts live music, Osamu and Masayo have created a legacy, 
one that has and will likely continue to spawn new musical communities, some fixed to place and others floating more freely through touring circuits and networks of influence. Performing and composing music together is not the only means of establishing intergenerational relationships in Toyama's commercial music scenes. Some club owners play an important role as well. Suimi, a bar and music venue on Toyama's Sogawa covered shopping street, hosts a regular jazz jam session where older and younger musicians, including professionals and amateurs, perform together. Regular attendees also benefit from the owner's advice and commentary. Although they themselves do not typically play, they are longtime active and discerning listeners. Five Spot, one of the oldest extant dedicated jazz venues in Toyama City, is an important hub for local jazz musicians and audience members, acting simultaneously as a commercial enterprise, a venue for artistic presentation, and an educational institution. Most days, Five Spot operates as a jazz kisa, where the owner serves food and drinks but also presents carefully chosen playlists of classic jazz recordings, chosen from an impressive library of CDs. As detailed by E. Taylor Atkins and others concerned with the long history of jazz in Japan, Jazz Kisa allowed musicians in post-war Japan to access and study the work of a variety of ja American jazz musicians, directly contributing to the growth of the music in Japan and the ability of Japanese musicians to participate in a transnational jazz community. In addition to its operation most days as a Jazz Kisa, Five Spot occasionally hosts performances by touring nationally or internationally known musicians, but there's limited space and entrance in these instances commands a high price. Only true aficionados both know of the club and are willing to pay the high cost of entry to see touring performers. On most Friday and Saturday nights, however, Five Spot hosts live jazz performances by a house pianist or a small combo. Unlike the Cotton Club and Alibaba, Five Spot performances adhere strictly to the fairly conservative canon of bebop and post-bop jazz repertoire and playing conventions as established in the 1950s to 60s by Black American performers what jazz musicians in the US and elsewhere sometimes refer to as straight ahead jazz. While many members of the house bands that perform regularly at Five Spot are older musicians with a great deal of performing experience, the regular inclusion of one or two younger or less experienced musicians in the house bands allows the club to serve as a home base and advanced training ground for some of Toyama's most promising up and coming straight ahead jazz performers. I'll note that while they stick to straight ahead repertoire and playing conventions while at Five Spot, nearly all of the club's regular performers do sometimes play jazz fusions, rock, pop, or other styles of commercial music at other venues. Toyama City is a small city, and musicians generally have to be flexible and versatile to gather enough paid work to make a living off of music alone. I first learned about Five Spot in 2011 when one of their regular pianists, Ino Yui, came to the Cotton Club to meet me. She had heard there was a foreign jazz bassist living in Toyama, possibly from one of the musicians who played regularly both in Tommy's house band and at Five Spot. I went to Five Spot one Saturday when I was not playing at the Cotton Club. Yui was playing with a small group of older musicians. They invited me to sit in with them near the end of the first set, after which the owner, a small energetic bald man with fingers missing from both hands, took an interest in me. He excitedly told me that I could have a real future in jazz because I had good technique, understood the traditional conventions, and, most importantly, had a good face. On subsequent visits, he was always surrounded by customers during set breaks, talking with them, commenting on the musicians or on well-known jazz musicians, talking about particularly interesting concerts he had been to, and sometimes telling stories of he and his wife's trips to Africa. While he entertained customers in between sets, his wife tended bar and prepared food. Together, the two of them made Five Spot an important center for a community united by their appreciation of or participation in straight ahead jazz. When I returned in 2019, I learned that the owner had died. His wife, Sakakibara Harumi, now owns and operates Five Spot alone, and the club still serves as a locus for the straight ahead jazz community in Toyama. With her husband's passing, her own responsibilities have increased, but she still capably manages the venue. While she is less talkative than her late husband, she keeps customers engaged, cultivating regulars by listening attentively and commenting thoughtfully, as well as by continuing to book musicians and curate playlists for Five Spot's midweek operations as a jazz kisa. Five Spot's dedication to a particular understanding of jazz as historical and contemporary aesthetic practice means that this community adheres slightly differently than those attached to the Cotton Club or Alibaba. 
While Five Spot may have once depended on the charisma of the owners, through their efforts, the venue has become a symbol for straight ahead jazz in Toyama, and as such, it could continue to serve as a center for its small but dedicated community based on this reputation, even if the individuals who initially cultivated that reputation are no longer around. The musical communities centered around the Cotton Club, Alibaba, and Five Spot are all in different life stages and take somewhat different forms. They're limited in their reach, but stable while they last. While traveling performers do sometimes pass through these local centers, they all serve a primarily local community. Through the work of musicians and owners, memories of performances and friendly interactions at all of these locations have accumulated over time, adhering to the clubs themselves, making them into powerful catalysts for the creation and maintenance of musical communities. While the local focus of these clubs means that these communities may be disrupted if the clubs close or a particularly important individual is lost, the influence of these musical lichens extends beyond their own lifespans. Those people and the relationships formed over the years at these clubs persist, even if they become untethered to place, potentially adhering to new locations or establishing new ones, in the model of those that have come before. Some, like the Cotton Club, Alibaba, and Five Spot, may exist for years as friendly colleagues, serving different but sometimes overlapping populations, much like older and younger musicians who grow to act as collaborators in Toyama City's commercial music scene. The overlap in generations, communities, and life stage of these musical lichens is important to the maintenance of community tied to place in Toyama City. With too strict a compartmentalization, the loss of a single club or even performer could destroy an entire cohort's connections to the place. It's the coexistence of multiple such institutions and individuals serving these communities in concert that allows Toyama City's commercial music scene to play a role in connecting people to each other and to place. When a community becomes untethered from one spot, they're not set adrift with nowhere else to welcome them. They may find solidarity at the city's other commercial music institutions, forging new friendships and musical connections, connections which will one day inspire new creative partnerships that may generate and fuel new musical centers for their own growing and thriving communities. Hello. Hi. Can you all hear me? Making sure that you all can hear me. Um, thank you so much, Donnie, for that wonderful, really stimulating talk. Um, I was particularly struck as I because I've watched it before and I watched it again. Now, two things I just want to compliment you on. One of the beautiful visuals, you know, you really give us a sense of what these places actually feel like, and that's both by the the images you're including but also the quality of your narrative where you're describing like you shift beautifully in between the the theoretical analysis and then the, these very deeply personal narratives you know like in particular when you're talking to osamu's widow and this beautiful sharing of a whiskey or a bottle of wine with with, with the slightly off kilter person <laughs> there as well so um, thank you for that, because I think that's one of the wonderful things that we as ethnomusicologists, anthropologists can do is to bring both that theoretical and the lived, the real together and captivate audiences. So I certainly am captivated by that. Really appreciate that. Um, I did reflect on a couple of things that I wanted to to start our discussion with. And, and one of those is. Well, they're related. So let me say one of the questions I would pose to you is to, to tell us a little bit more about how your theory does, in fact, apply or ha or could it apply to other musics in Toyama? Um, because what, when I listen to this, you know, as a person who works in or used to work in hardcore punk raves as well, techno, um, other types of musics like that, I think that. For me, I have a strong sense that what you're talking about here, right? This this ability of the the light, the musical lichen, uh, feels very jazz. 
it, it feels not only a Toyama thing, but it also feels a very jazz thing. So that's where I wonder how this might have um, applications or reflections that you, you could share with us um, for other musics. Maybe we'll stop there and I'll share my next question after that. Sure. Um, so the, I think it's different. I, I think as, as you suggested, I think it can be very different depending on the type of music. Um, I, so there's another, uh, I don't, I don't really go into it here, but there's a, probably the, the performance style that Toyama is best known for outside of Toyama is um, a traditional festival called Owara Kaze no Bon. And um, Toyama is kind of a strange uh, configuration because it's a, uh, a consolidation of, of multiple towns that existed independently prior to this. So, Within Toyama, what's now Toyama City, Owara Kaze no Bon is thought of as this very specific style to Yatsu Omachi, which is one of the towns that was conglomerated into Toyama City. Outside of Toyama City, where people are less familiar with this history and, and this division within the, the city, uh, Owara Kaze no Bon is thought of as a very Toyama thing, um, except for people who are already familiar with Toyama. Um, and, and this one, this has a very, very intense connection between place and style. Um, to where I, I've heard people describe this as, as kind of the town and the music, the dance are unimaginable without one another. Um, they have so thoroughly come to define this place and the place has so thoroughly defined the style for the people who are familiar with it, that um, I, I think that moving it somewhere else, people would almost not not think of it as being the same thing anymore. Um, I think that gets uh, that relationship can be very different for somewhere or for a style of music that is thought of as a connection to an international community or or a national community, um, and to be honest, I was uh, part of me is surprised that that jazz clubs in Toyama have taken on this um, this very local character. But but jazz musicians everywhere I've gone have have a strong sense of of historicity and lineage and things. So so those all certainly lend themselves to generating this kind of commu idea of community in place. Um, so you know famous clubs become part of the history and and part of the family almost just like people do. Um, so it, it, yeah, it depends. Um, I, I think even the fact that one of the clubs is named Cotton Club is just right. perfect evidence of what you just said, right? There's definitely, there's definitely nobody's going to hear that and not think of the original Cotton Club, right? And there are there are Cotton Clubs in a bunch of Japanese cities. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, it's just something to keep thinking about because the idea of having you, you know networks of of institutions and individuals that create the community that that can exist even if it becomes untethered from a specific place or vice versa if a person passes and and you might still have the place to to serve as as a connection um there's this i get this idea of the individuals and the institutions in that network um, I, I do still would, would argue a little bit that it's, it, you're going to find that in particular in jazz communities globally. Um, 
I'm going to chew a little bit more on that myself on how that might happen in other musics. But I do think that's quite different than when you have a, a folk music, traditional music, or as you rightly pointed out, the, the Iemoto system is very different feeling than what you're talking about here. What what the intentions of that that transmission of that music is is trying to accomplish and how community is built within those networks is is quite different. So maybe that would take me to to the, my other question, and we can continue to see if we can flesh some of this out. Which is, in the beginning of your talk, you you mentioned how the these plans that are underway that are city supported to help create these intergenerational moments. And again, I do see that as particularly, maybe that's where I want to, maybe that's where I need to clarify my own language here is to say it's the intergenerational intergener institutions and individuals that feels very jazz, um, that you're not as likely going to have intergenerational intersections in electronica or in hardcore to some degree, because we still have a lot of folks in their fifties who do do these things. Um, who were the original electronic masters back in the nineties and they're still out there spinning and, and spreading their word. But in this, this idea of Toyama, what, where this, this intentional creation of intergenerational musicking opportunities, is that in fact being parlayed and spread into other urban centers? And if so, how is it being accepted and applied and how might it modify? So how much of this therefore is jazz specific, attaching to my preceding comment, and how much of this is Toyama specific? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so I think, um, I think first, um, I will say that um, sort of getting at the relationship between this sort of the kinds of the kinds of relationships I'm describing and the compact compact city plan. The compact city plan does include some uh, programs like uh, volunteer programs to try to connect people across generations. Um, there is also extensive promotion of um, local folk music and and local art forms. Uh, there are uh, institutions and museums that that are dedicated to supporting and um, ensuring for the transmission of art forms seen as distinct or local to Toyama. Jazz is not not one of those. Blues is not one of those. Rock, pop, they're very much understood as being these, these cosmopolitan or international or foreign music. Um, so they, they don't really receive much by way of institutional support. Um, so, so part of what I'm, I'm getting at here is that while this is not um, explicitly supported by uh, municipal programs in the compact city plan, it is, very much an important, this kind of relationship, I think, is uh, very important to the potential success of this kind of program, because not everybody is involved in performing folk music or making glass art. There's a, a big uh, glass art museum and, and uh, studio in Toyama. Um, probably far more people are interested in these sort of cosmopolitan musics, um, rock, pop, some electronica happens in Toyama. There are a few clubs that have it. Um, uh, and jazz. Um, I think, I think, um, uh, I think that this is certainly a, a common feature of jazz and jazz communities and jazz clubs. But I think that Two of the three, the three places. Uh, so I think both Osamu and Tommy would object to the label of jazz musician, and that's not 
not such an uncommon thing. I went to school with a lot of people who I think of as jazz musicians who don't like calling themselves jazz musicians now. And there are all kinds of reasons to do that, um, both political and economic and artistic. Um, but uh, I... Uh, I think of both of these men as as more kind of uh, songsters, to use a, a term from one of my one of my mentors. Um, it's the Cotton Club says jazz on on the sign, um, but we didn't play a whole lot of jazz standards there. Um, we didn't. Uh, I, when playing jazz in Philadelphia, I, where I lived before, or or in the D.C. area where I live now, um, people wouldn't necessarily bat an eye in some places if a saxophonist takes a five or six minute long solo. Uh, in the Cotton Club, if you took more than thirty seconds to a minute on a solo, you were gonna you were gonna have problems with <laughs> with Tommy because that's not that's not what people came to hear they they want something um that that has some things in common with jazz and sometimes is is jazz or sounds like jazz but that's not that's not what they want um so i guess the answer is is kind of both uh it's a toyama thing it's also a jazz thing um i could certainly see how a music like like hardcore would uh, be almost resistant to uh, the same degree of of uh, kind of genealogical thinking. Although, I, as you said, there there are lots of of uh, re references to two prior generations of hardcore going on. Uh, I think maybe the generations just come faster and than than in jazz. Uh, there might just be a physical longevity <laughs> issue yeah. in some cases too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm also kind of wondering, I'm listening to you. I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm kind of wondering if the compact city plan has created, if not an eagerness, but a recognition uh, or a valuing of this, of an intergenerational exchange. So although I do, I, I, I can think of, of, that as a jazz model, but I can also think of that um, as as something that might resonate with this plan in Toyoma specific, right? So even if you're not participating in that compact city plan that's programming this folk music, because that's not your jam, the folk music isn't your jam, but you're aware that those things are happening in your city. You're aware, I'm assuming the way you spoke about it, that it's, it's, being presented as a, as a fairly successful model. It's um, having, having um, you know, I mean, the, the shrinking population in rural areas is really a crisis in Japan, right? So to have any success in, in, in keeping um, or create, creating stability in population is something to ap applaud and, and to look at and to research and, and to understand. And so if people in that area are hearing this as a positive plan that it might make them more open and aware and accepting and seeking of those kinds of intergenerational ex ex exchanges. Because the young people who are staying in the area must have a, a commitment, I would imagine, to that area. And so that how are they going to create and replicate that commitment in yet further younger generations? Does that make sense? Yeah. And um, I, I want to add two things to that, which I haven't brought up before. It's a big project. Um, <laughs> Uh, one is, um, so the, um, the Cotton Club actually has at a couple of points had a, uh, a student kind of intern, um, come, come and work for them on, on weekends through, through part of this, this program. So there, there are pieces of this program that are placing um, younger people who may not have any pre-existing connection to this scene in in professional capacities working with with older people, uh, particularly business owners. Um, it's a really big effort across across multiple domains, uh, volunteering, uh, private sector 
commercial stuff, tourism, uh, infrastructure, all kinds of things. Um, I think that uh, you're absolutely right that the, this plan is, is very widely known. Um, when I told people in Toyama that I wanted to, I came up with the name for the, the dissertation towards the end of the time I was there. And it was uh, uh, Sounds of the Compact City. And, and they loved that. They're like, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a great idea. Yep. Call it, call it that. Um, and, um, and I, I think it certainly has reinforced uh, these ideals. An important thing, and I think this is absolutely key to this plan's success writ large. And I think it's uh, something that would be very important to consider when thinking about the possibility of using it or something like it anywhere else is that this, was based, um, the priorities of this plan were based on, uh, I think it was 200 um, uh, meetings, a couple hours long each with people all over this, this spread out um, um, geographic region before, before any of these programs got put in place to find out what it was that people wanted and would accept. So, so the government had an idea for this is this is what we're we're looking like we're going to have given the the demographic shift going on. Um, so this, there's sort of a hard limit on the the number of dollars we can expect to have coming in after a certain point. Um, what what can we do to run things more efficiently, and what will people accept, and what will what do people need? Um, and what they need is not they obviously need access to food and shelter and healthcare and and socialization, but they also need um, these kinds of emotional connections to place. And and there are some mountainous, very sparsely populated regions that they had their train stations built up just like other parts of Toyama, because I'm sure an official went out there and talked to some of these people whose family had lived up in the mountains for generations. And they said, I'm not I'm not leaving. Like it doesn't matter if you <laughs> cut off my water and and my food and or or my access to the hospital. I'm not going anywhere. This is where I live. Um, so they said, well, we can't we can't just abandon those people. Um, and and uh, I'll say sort of an early sign of how a younger generation is picking up this connection to place. Um, Yuri Matsuda, Tommy's daughter. Uh, has been working on a project um, with a local singer recently um, uh, named Shiratamana, and they call their project uh, Shiratama Kurotama, um, white white egg, black egg, or jewel, and sort of a play on their her name too. And they've written at least one song in Toyama Ben, which is this local dialect that's, uh, it's pretty rare that young people speak it at this point, um, but uh, quite quite different from, from the way people in the Tokyo area speak uh, as sort of a marker of distinction. So there's, there's some sort of sense that active preservation of that connection to place is important. Um, and that I, I have talked to a few people who who think of that dialect as being part of part of their connection to their their grandparents or or the people who have lived there before. That makes sense um, across Japan as well, right? The the connection to those. Um particularly, again, rural dialects is going to have, for the people who are attaching to them, identifying with them, it has, it's very potent. The meaning is potent, right? You're, it, mm -hmm. is, it is an intergenerational connection with a grandparent. That's really an interesting idea. Yeah. Well, I think that's also what I appreciate hearing is is this this fine researching with the stakeholders, right? What are the, this important, many of us are involved in, um, you know, trying to to do 
ethical community engagement work. And it's so important to be speaking with the stakeholders. And one mistake, I, I don't want to, you know, leave the impression that I'm thinking this or that anybody is thinking, and you're certainly not thinking this, is that, you know, Japan is monolithic. We know that's absolutely not true. And so even though I'm asking which, the, which are there potential applications to take from this Toyama uh, compact city plan that could be applicable in other places, I think that you raise a good point that in order to do that, that you need to have really thorough research with what, what are the unique needs of those regional individuals, and then to determine how um, an intergenerational plan or any other plan might make a more efficient city, might make living there more humane for everybody involved. And then, of course, what types of musics could be valued in there? Because I could imagine in Akita, a very different kind of situation and different kinds of musics would be at play. Anything down in, Con in um, Kansai region, you're going to likely have a very different set of circumstances at play. Different, And so... Um, I'd be curious to see, though, what theories, if people do pick up on this theory, I'd be, I know it's beyond the scope of your project, but I'd be curious to see if there are larger na national initiatives that are pursuing this at the regional level and at the local level. So so I can say that there are, um, there are some other cities that are, uh, I think, I think it's, they're calling it future cities, but they're, they're yeah, sort of yeah, yeah. all, all attempting these kind of novel approaches to, to design. But I think, I think that is the key lesson that, that has to be, that can be learned from Toyama's particular approach is talk to the people first uh, and see what they really need and, and design the plan around that because that's, that's the way it's, it's got a chance of, of working. Um, I think, I think you take that down to the micro level. One of the comments um, that Tommy, taught you all, or he was doing it himself when you were determining set lists, you got to look at your audience and think about what were they listening to when they were teenagers, mm -hmm. right? Because, because yes, there are studies, neuroscientific studies now are, and, and psychological studies are, are giving us the data that shows that yes, the music we listen to when our brains are forming as teenagers, that we're using to negotiate complex emerging adult emotional situations all of that sound is the most important music for most people the rest of their life, right? And that's cool. I, that's, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are reasons for it. Um, and it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. It's when you're an adolescent and you are trying to deal with complex situations you've never had to deal with before, but you don't have the emotional maturity yet to articulate. The words and sounds and music help negotiate those emotional moments, right? They provide they they give sound to the effective moment right. um and it also has to do with how the brain is developing right the, the brain the brain doesn't finish developing until you're in your mid to late 20s i'm not the expert on this it's more like i i listen to people say this who are the experts and i go that makes yeah. total sense total sense mm -hmm. but what he was doing was also sort of picking up on who's your audience mm -hmm. And and you could take that nugget, who's the audience on that night, think about the music that are important to them, who's your audience in th this urban planning, and what do they need, whether that's do they, is this a, a, a regional community that will identify with jazz, or is this, is it a, a community that needs a different kind of music, you know. Jazz, jazz is, and I know we're using jazz as like this, this great big giant umbrella term that refers to a whole bunch of stuff, but um it does it reaches a lot of generations and, I, and I, yeah yeah i, I want to say that i think i think at the the larger scale level it's really important to have more than one more than one thing i think yeah. um one of one of the things that makes toyama city as um i don't know as as livable or as as uh, attractive to stay in as it is to the people who are there is that people people often want to look outside their own town or their own home. Um, they want to they want to be part of the world. They also want to be part of their local communities. Um, so I think it's important to have um, ways ways for them to engage with both. And I think to some extent, um, jazz, blues, rock, popular music these are all ways of them in for people to engage with the world beyond their city or their, their sort of immediate physical reach. Um, uh, Masayo at, uh, at Alibaba has, has never left Toyama city, wow. but, but she's, 
she's had this huge, uh, you know, wealth of experience in her life dealing with people from all over the world just in this club. But, I mean, she's, I, I was really surprised she hadn't lived um, in a, a country where English is the most common language spoken for, for an extended period because she was, she spoke English so naturally and, and um, easily. Uh, and, and, and also, I mean, that just, just sitting in, in that club, I mean, there's, uh, there are pictures of some of them signed of, of blues musicians from all over the world. I think there was a poster signed by Eric Clapton on the wall. Um, it's, and there are these little there are these little hubs where people can engage with the whole world out out there um, without without being able to or without having to travel there depending on the situation. But at, at the same time, they they have something that feels unique to them. That's that's their sort of mark of distinction. I think both are important. I appreciate that. It's remarkable. Remarkable person, I think that has something to say to about her as a person too. Yeah, I, all all of these people, um, all of these club owners who just just their ability to to deal with customers is, or or just to deal with people because um, they have so many different kinds of people coming through. It's uh, very impressive to me. Um, for sure. And I just saw we had a, a, I am listening to you, but I just was momentarily, my eyes went to the chat because uh, Annie, mm -hmm. um, since we have a question, I, Annie, do you want me to read that or? So we have a question here. There is a very specific relationship between jazz culture and USA, Japan. Would you share your thoughts on this relationship? Sure. Um, I I think the this is a, a big question, and um, it is as a whole. I'd say it's beyond my ability to answer, but I can give some 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 thoughts and a couple of stories, maybe. Um, so uh, <clears throat> jazz has been, been played in Japan by Japanese musicians for um, more than 100 years now. It's uh, very early in the 20th century. We know that there were, there were Japanese musicians playing jazz. Um, there are different stories of, of how how that happened, how they were first exposed to it. Um, I suspect there was more than one way around the same time. Um, I know that that musicians in the Philippines probably acted as an important um, go between between the US because of our military activities and, uh, and um, Japan. Uh, But so so for a very long time, Japanese musicians have been playing jazz um, because because of the history of jazz. I I will say that jazz jazz is a Black American music. Um, It, and what I mean by that is that um, the the sort of both both that that many of the the most important drivers of of style in the music have been uh, Black American performers, but also that um, the the sort of core aesthetics I 
I uh, subscribe to um, uh, an idea that the core aesthetics of jazz are um, stemming from the Black American community writ large. But, uh, calling calling that a single unified community also has all kinds of problems. But um, so so with that understanding. Um, the the relationship between the U.S. and Japan, as jazz, where jazz is concerned, is complicated and has been fraught at times. Um, and uh, there have been many accounts of Japanese performers and and dedicated listeners sort of um, adopting what. E. Taylor Atkins called strategies of authentication to sort of justify their participation in an, an art form that they understood to be both nationally and ethnically foreign to them. Um, I'm not, I'm in no position to declare anybody right or wrong on, on that account. Um, I'll say that, that before I went when I was when I was in college doing my bachelor's degree in jazz performance, I I was taking some some Japanese classes and I had been to Japan briefly a couple times in high school and uh, my my jazz instructors encouraged me to try to go play in Japan and what I won't say names specifically but what what some of them said were things like uh, oh yeah go over there you'll you'll have all the gigs because because they don't really know how to how to play like like we do here and i that that is not uh <laughs> that's not the reality um on the ground at all uh um there there has been a great deal uh, as i said a very long history of jazz being played in japan and a great deal of exchange between the us and and japan uh, performers have gone back and forth between the two. Uh, recordings have circulated and, and been a very important source of connection. And with the internet, I mean, a Japanese musician my age or younger has access to all the recordings I do. Um, so it's it's. Uh, I I will also say that some of the musicians in the Tokyo scene that I've talked to have kind of uh, complained a little bit about the prevalence of what they call the Berkeley style, because um, a lot of a lot of them and a lot of uh, the musicians sort of slightly older than them have studied at Berkeley College of Music in Boston, um, which is a really, I mean, that institution has a, a big place in, in jazz history and sort of defining the style of what's thought of as a straight ahead jazz now. Um, so it's it's complicated. That's a great question, and it's a really big question. Um, those are my thoughts. <laughs> thank you both so much. So I think that's all the time we have for now. But thank you both for such an engaging conversation. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in um, on YouTube. Um, so if you are a PhD student or scholar interested in traveling to Japan for research, I hope you'll follow the links below to learn more about our Japanese Studies Fellowship programs. Um, and you can also watch interviews with more of our former fellows right here on our YouTube channel. So thank you all so much again for joining us today, and please stay tuned for more lectures. <laughs>